Hello, come in. Ah, oh, come in. Good. I'm, I'm glad you've caught me. I'm, we're just getting packed and ready. I'm about to go off on a great adventure. What, which has partly prompted me to a particular book. You may remember I showed you um, some of these lovely modern but hand printed and illustrated editions of Keats. Do come and have a seat. So, um... I am going for the first time in my life to, amongst other places, Greece. I'm going on a sailing journey that's going to finish up. It's going to start in Istanbul, Constantinople, Byzantium as was. It's going to finish up in Athens and it's going to be sailing across the Aegean, therefore, much storied and fabled. I'm going to be following in the wake of St Paul, but I could equally be sailing with the Odyssean sailors. Anyway, just a touch Greek soil will be exciting. And um, well, there's a peculiar English appreciation of classical religion. There's something about the gods and goddesses, something about the way, but on the one hand they're distant, but on the other hand, we grew up with the stories. And I wanted to share with you, I think, um, one of Keats's most beautiful poems is Ode to Psyche. Psyche is a goddess. Of course, there's the Greek legends that come quite late of Cupid and Psyche. Psyche um, uh, falling in love with, with Eros, with Cupid. And Psyche, of course, uh, it's P-S-Y-C-H-E. It's where we, the Greek word means soul, and it's where we, we get, if you like, psychiatry or psychic or um, psychological. It's about that mysterious inner being that we have, which is more than just the additions or subtractions of our behaviour, but something about deep identity. Anyway, the reason why I want to read it is that, um, apart from the fact that it's very, very beautiful, is that Keats thinks of Psyche as almost the last of the goddesses and he thinks of himself as having been, of her as having been born as it were too late for the full glory of Olympus and then he thinks of himself as having been born too late to have known that beautiful enchanted world and in the end the poem becomes a hymn to and a lament for Psyche in the deepest sense, soul. He's living in, in London, he's, he's, he's in the beginning of a kind of industrial age that's, you know, just breaking everything down into mere material bits and pieces and he's going for, 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 for a sort of very utilitarian, very vis. And what he's longing is to live in a world such as that of pagan antiquity, when there was psyche, there was soul in everything, everything was alive, was animated. Anima, of course, also means soul. And... Uh, there's a beautiful passage in this of kind of lament for that lost enchantment. And I think Keats is ahead of his time here. You can read in lots of places among both scientists and theologians of the, the, the project of re-enchantment, the need to re-enchant the world. And this is a poem precisely lamenting the loss of enchantment and longing for re-enchantment. So... Um, uh, he says in a letter uh, in which he enclosed the poem, Keats says, you, correct, you recollect that Psyche was not embodied as a goddess before the time of Apuleius, the Platonist, who lived after the Augustan age, and consequently the goddess was never worshipped or sacrificed to with any of the ancient fervour, and perhaps never thought of in the old religion. I am more orthodox than to let a heathen goddess be so neglected. That's a wonderful new use of the word orthodox, but there's something in it. So here's his ode to Psyche. O goddess, hear these tuneless numbers rung by sweet enforcement and remembrance, dear, and pardon that thy secrets should be sung even into thine own soft conjured ear. Surely, I dreamed today, or did I see the winged psyche with awakened eyes, 
I wandered in a forest thoughtlessly, and on the sudden, fainting with surprise, saw two fair creatures couched side by side in deepest grass beneath the whispering roof of leaves and trembled blossoms where there ran a brooklet scarce espied. It's a beautiful engraving there. Mid hushed, cool rooted flowers, fragrant eyed, blue, silver white, and budded Tyrian, they lay calm breathing on the bedded grass, their arms embraced and their pinions too, their lips touched not, but had not bade adieu, as if disjoined by a soft-handed slumber, and ready still, past kisses to outnumber, at tender eye-dawn of aurorian love. The winged boy I knew, but who wast thou, O oh, happy, happy dove, his psyche true? O oh, latest born and loveliest vision far of all Olympus' faded hierarchy, fairer than Phoebe's sapphire regent star, or Vesper, amorous glowworm of the sky, fairer than these, though temple thou hadst none, nor altar heaped with flowers, nor virgin choir to make delicious moan upon the midnight hours, no voice, no lute, no pipe, no incense sweet from chain-swung censer teeming, no shrine, no grove, no oracle, no heat of pale-mouthed prophet dreaming. O brightest, though too late for antique vows, too, too late for the fond believing lyre, when holy were the haunted forest boughs, holy the air, the water and the fire, yet even in these days, so far retired from happy pieties, thy lucent fans fluttering among the faint Olympians, I see and sing by my own eyes inspired. So let me be thy choir and make a moan upon the midnight hours, thy voice, thy lute, thy pipe, thy incense sweet from swinged censer teeming, thy shrine, thy grove, thy oracle, thy heat of pale mouth prophet dreaming. Yea, I will be thy priest and build a fane in some untrodden region of my mind where branched thoughts new grown with pleasant pain instead of pines shall murmur in the wind far far around shall those dark clustered trees fledge the wild rigid mountains steep by steep and there by zephyrs streams and birds and bees the moss-lane dryads shall be lulled to sleep and in the midst of this wide quietness a rosy sanctuary I will dress with the wreathed trellis of a working brain, with buds and bells and stars without a name, with all the gardener fancy e'er could feign, who breeding flowers will never breed the same. And there shall be for thee all soft delight that shadowy thought can win, a bright torch and a casement ope at night to let the warm love in. <laughs> Just astonishing end to that poem, you know. Uh, but uh, it's uh, the, that realisation that once you could have looked at the world and said, holy were the haunted forest boughs, holy the air, the water and the fire, and the need somehow to recover that awe, that sense of reverence, that sense of the numinous and the luminous kind of gleaming through things. And in the end, Keats says, if I can't do it out there, at the very least, I'll do it in here. I will within, as he calls it, some untrodden region of my mind, I will build a fane. And of course, by writing the poem, He's doing the very thing he says, promises Psyche he will do. Because once you've read this poem, once you've heard it, that fane, that beautiful place, that sense of something in the holy woods, which is open to soul, and of that magic casement open when love meets soul. And that's, of course, what the story of Cupid and Psyche is really all about. Uh, anyway, I thought it would be nice as I'm going to the Arcadian and Olympian places to just to remember what Keats 
calls so beautifully the happy pieties. Uh, so thanks for dropping around and for listening, and I'll see you when I get back from my holiday. <laughs>